have a son as an attorney or a pilot. I want <laughs> vitamins. I want those in the chat. That's, that's better than the alternative. <laughs> Man, you look old. <laughs> No, you look so good. You that. said our youngest is an attorney. I'm thinking, well, how old is this dude? <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. I'm Thank gonna you. start broadcasting us to Facebook. Oh, okay. Hopefully, I can get it. Um, last time, my internet was given such a hard time. And then I'll open up the broadcast. So Roxana, before I introduce him, I'm going to do the, the, The emo oh yes, so we had we were trying to. Um, I told him I didn't know whether you're going to do it before you introduced him or after the emotions check. Uh, I think what if people aren't going to want to hear from me after I read his bio. No, so I think we do it before. Okay. What do you think? No, I think that's good. Yeah, because I don't. I want. I want. I want to listen. I okay. All right, and so. Oh, I made my own guacamole on Sunday. <laughs> I have tried to do that. I have not mastered that yet. Oh my gosh! And I had it on a rice cake. I was like, mm, "This is living." Is <laughs> so welcome, everyone. We're now live, <laughs> talking about guacamole. But it, it's 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 good because we're talking about our our my food, my mind, nutrition, and mental health in the Black community. So welcome everyone to our Mind Health Shop Talk. We're just going to give people a few minutes. Um, people are checking in. Welcome A. John, Barry, Hi, Miss Lynn, Roberta, Chantel. So people are still coming in, so welcome. And we're also live on Facebook. So hello everyone on Facebook. We'll be answering your questions as well tonight. We have a great instructor, presenter, speaker for you. We're excited. Hello, Tracy. Uh-oh, somebody's in the chat. Let's see what the chat says. Oh, hey, Lynn. <laughs> Just Lynn saying hi. And our speaker for the evening is on with our executive director and Ms. Regina Webb. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. So people are still checking in. Hello, Tracy. So we'll do our intro for our Mind Health Shop Talk today. I just want to welcome everyone to our Mind Health Shop Talk. This is the first one for the new year. Um, so my food, my mind, nutrition and mental health in the Black community. First Mind Health Shop Talk of the year. So I just wanted to say Happy New Year to everyone. I'm glad that we made it to 2021. Um, and just being grateful that you guys have decided to come and spend this time with us tonight. So just a little bit about the Mind Health Shop Talk. The Black Mental Health Alliance is um, grateful to work with Kaiser Permanente's Good Hair, Health and Great Hair Barbershop and Beauty Salon Network Outreach Initiatives through beauty shops and barbershops in West Baltimore. These forums are led by licensed mental health clinicians and include culturally competent mental health information and resources. So now we say culturally grounded. So I got to update that term. Um, so our Mind Health Shop Talk sessions are usually held in the partner shops and salons. Um, and it, we started the new season of them September 2020 and will continue until June 2021. 
Due to the COVID-19 pandem pandemic, we'll now be doing the shop talks virtually um, through Zoom. So tonight, oops, we're not doing Ms. Alma Roberts. Ms. Regina Webb will be on. I forgot to update this. I'm sorry, Regina. Um, so Ms. Regina Webb, she is the program manager for Kaiser Permanente for the regional um, for the Mid-Atlantic region. She will be introducing the Good Health, Great Hair initiatives. Ms. Regina, welcome. Thank you, Roxana. So I'd like to thank Andrea and Roxana, Black Mental Health Alliance, for continuing to be a partner of Good Health and Great Hair. Good Health and Great Hair is Kaiser Permanente's community health outreach initiative. Um, in which we partner with barber shops and salons located in West Baltimore um, to bring vital services to the community, including social support services like Black Mental Health Alliance with the Mind Health Shop Talks. We also have financial wellness sessions as well as nutrition and fitness classes. In addition to our health services that we provide on site, we provide flu shots and glucose testing, blood pressure and BMI testing um, in the community every weekend on Fridays and Saturdays at shops in West Baltimore. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the program. Um, just to be aware, our next uh, sessions will be, will be relaunching again um, in the community and beginning on February 6th. Um, so we hope that um, any, if you are in the area that you can stop by, if you haven't already gotten your flu shot, um, please stop by. We're, we'll be at one of our shops. Um, you'll get a full listing of all of the, our events um, coming up um, as a part of um, in an email or as a follow-up to this meeting. So I just wanted to thank Black Mental Health Alliance for providing us with an opportunity to provide this platform. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. So Regina, someone is asking, Ms. Tracy is asking if you're in DC and I don't think you're launched in DC yet, right? Correct, we have okay. not yet launched in DC but we are hoping to expand our program um, into DC and DC Southern um, Maryland as well as the Northern Virginia area within the next year. Awesome, awesome. So up next, we'll have Ms. Andrea Brown. She will be introducing um, our, I'm sorry, not the partnership with Black, um, talking a little bit more about Black Mental Health Alliance. Ms. Andrea Brown. Yes, thank you so much for joining us this evening. This is super exciting. Um, and a special thanks to our partner, collaborator, and, and sponsor in this important work, Kaiser Permanente. I want to thank uh, Alma Roberts in her absence and Regina for their forward thinking and innovative programming. And as we exchange and as we engage in critical discussions during this moment, um, I appreciate your being open. And so I will say this, I'm gonna go off script for like a minute. Somebody asked about DC, if you were in DC just yet. And so while she said no, but she anticipates being there uh, through uh, probably in the year, just know that we will partner with them wherever they go. And so you can believe that Black Mental Health Alliance will meet you in DC, in Philadelphia, wherever you are, we will be. And so I am Andrea Brown, the Executive Director for the Black Mental Health Alliance. I've been on board now 10 months, super excited about that. And I have to tell you, we find ourselves at this juncture at the Black Mental Health Alliance um, in a critical place, not just in the country, not just because of the pandemic, where we find ourselves as people. And we will continue, we, are, we, we make a promise that we are committed to serving the community through training, through all of those kinds of things that uh, promote optimal health and wellness for black people. And so you can trust that we are your trusted partner in this moment. And so our ability to serve you may look different via web, uh, via this virtual space, but our commitment uh, to serve you and always tell you the truth about where we are and where we are as a people has not changed. So this is super exciting. I am going to introduce our speaker, but before I do that, I want to, I just want to do a quick check-in. Lots been going on um, across the country, infiltration, heightened infiltration of racism. So I want to ask you to put in the chat box, 
what are your top three emotions that you felt in the past 48 hours? And they can be good or they can be wherever you find yourself in the uh, past 48 hours. So definitely want you to, um, to share. Oh, trepidation. Thank you, Tracy, for sharing that. Um, for, I have to share with you something quickly. Anybody else, please share some of your thoughts with us. Um, on edge, but hoping for the best. Okay, thank you so much for that, Simone. Um, so, and Roxana has put up this emotion and feeling wheel up, but they, again, they can be uh, several, any number of things. I have to tell you, ambivalent. Thank you so much, Dawn, for that. Um, when we first did this at our staff meeting, I used the P word and it's not on here and it was pissed. Um, but that was shortly after something happened. Frustration, confusion, and shock. So thank you for those. Um, and listen, I didn't ask so that we could enter into a session, but I did ask because I think it's important to know where we find ourselves. And it is okay. This is a safe place. And I think as we talk about, uh, we are launching the year with a mantra about radical self-care. And as we talk about that, that doesn't mean just the physical. That also means our inner and our outer. So um, so thank you for being, uh, for sharing. And so I know that, uh, again, use this. I stole this from one of our partners and I use it every time I get an opportunity. <clears throat> and so, again, thank you. So I'm going to introduce I will not, um, I will not uh, hold us up, but let me just talk to you about Dr. Philip Halstead. He's a graduate of Tufts University School of Medicine, where he was trained in traditional medicine. He served as captain in the medical corps of the United States Air Force. And after years of practice, Dr. Halstead recognized the need to treat patients holistically to include body, mind, and spirit and that the most fundamental treatment is summed up in the adage, let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. He incorporated the importance of nutrition into his care of patients. And after 31 years of practice, he was probably only 12, um, Dr. Halstead is now a health coach, educator, and public speaker. Please join me in welcoming him with a virtual clap. Thank you so much, Dr. Halstead. And we, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for that uh, uh, introduction. And uh, Roxana, again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come before your group again to share vital information. I think um, hopefully will um, really be of benefit to everyone. I think especially in this time that we're in now for the last 10 months or so with uh, COVID, um, it's been a strain on all of us. Um, not just um, financially and socially, but also mentally, okay? Because the, the, the way, obviously the way we keep the, the virus intact or in check is through distancing and somewhat isolation and quarantine, things like this. This is really going against really our, our nature. Our, as social beings, we really like to be among each other and not be isolated, but as a necessary evil because of COVID, we've had to have this uh, this isolation, this even just even just the wearing mask. I mean, you can't even see someone's whole face now. I mean, so you really don't even, if, if you meet somebody for the first time, you don't even know what they look like. You know what their eyes look like, but you don't know what the rest of their face is, looks like. So it's been really kind of a, a strain on, I think on our mental, um, our mental being. So what we're going to talk about today is things that we can do primarily in the realm of nutrition and food to really um, be able to um, bring our mental status up to where it needs to be and to keep it strong um, in this time of extra stress, okay? It's really common, commonly known, I think now, as we get more into um, self-care and trying to really figure out ways that we can really take care of ourselves. We're understanding now that the root cause of mental illness, while environment and genetics are important, a lot, in a, to a large extent, the, the cause of mental illness is related to what we eat. It, it's related to how we feed our cells, okay? Because our body is made of trillions of cells and our cells need to eat properly. And if they're not getting fed properly, then they, they, 
become deficient. And when cells become deficient in their energy production, then the whole body suffers. And, and certainly the, the, the whole nervous system and our mental health can really suffer as well. Okay, we have to be able to eat well to be, to be healthy. Diet is foundational to all serious health change. Is, is foundational for all, to all serious health changes for better or for worse. So it depends on what direction your diet goes in, okay? That will determine where your health is and there's no middle ground. You're either eating towards health or you're eating towards illness. There's nothing neutral. So it's one or the other that you're doing. And poor diets are linked to mental illness such as depression, anxiety, anger, violence, uh, including homicide and suicide. Okay, uh, poor diet will define later as far as what that is exactly, but way, the way we feed ourselves is vital. It is vital and it's something that I think most of us just overlook. We don't think of food as being at that important um, in terms of having a tremendous impact on our health, but it absolutely does, okay? The science linking diet to mental health is very strong. We really cannot detach the two. We cannot, there's no way you can separate them. There is a systemic destruction of our community through our diet, okay? Um, look at the way that a lot of black communities are set up is that many of them are victims of, of food deserts. They're, they become food deserts where there may be, you know, fast food chains on every corner, but there's no real good supermarkets with fresh produce, okay? I think that's one of the things that really has to be addressed um, in the black community is the, the, the whole issue of food deserts and getting healthier food, healthier options to the black community to be able to really um, improve our nutritional status. That's gonna be critical. We have to do that. That absolutely has to happen, okay? Many people don't realize it, but poor nutrition, we become victims of poor nutrition even before birth because the effects of poor diet start early in the pre-pregnant women who eat a poor diet and continue that diet through pregnancy. So over time that as you eat a poor diet, your vitamin and mineral content in your body just continually dwindles. It may not just drop through the floor, but this, this is a chronic thing. It's a chronic thing is if you eat chronically, a chronically poor diet over many years, eventually it's gonna take its toll. And this starts even before pregnancy, okay? So you have a woman who eats a nutrient poor diet, um, a bad diet over most of her life. Then she becomes pregnant and continues that diet during pregnancy. Well, what happens? What happens is she gives birth to a baby who's already nutritionally behind, nutritionally deficient, because the baby can't eat anything that the mother doesn't eat. The baby can't get any vitamins or minerals that the baby that the mother doesn't get. So we start out life behind the eight ball. We start out life behind and trying to catch up. Okay. But the problem is if we don't um, start to change our diets after, after we're born, then that continues to downward slide. You know, if, if the baby's born and continues to eat a poor diet, then the cycle just continues to, to circulate itself. So that cycle has to be broken, okay? Um, as a result of poor nutrition, children develop poor social and behavioral um, uh, characteristics. They become antisocial. Um, they have higher, actually higher levels of childhood cancer rates because they're eating poor diets, okay? School performance suffers. You know, we always talk about how important breakfast is. Many children go to school if they don't, and especially now where children aren't in school, they were relying on school to get breakfast. And now if they don't really, if they're at home trying to learn and don't eat breakfast, then they become even more nutritionally behind because they're not getting enough nutrients to their brain so that they can stay alert in class and be able to learn. Okay, so diet is critical to this whole process. Poor diet increases the risk of many other health conditions in general, increases the risk of obesity, um, increases the risk of other chronic diseases. You have a 47% higher chance of getting hypertension with a poor diet, a 50% chance of heart disease with a poor diet, 80% increased risk of stroke if your diet is not adequate. 
70 percent of, of um, a 70 percent increase in diabetes, a chance of diabetes with a poor diet. Okay, four times the risk of chronic renal disease and twice the risk of Alzheimer's as well. Um, so um, also increasing, uh, decreasing concentration and intellect affecting school performance. So diet, poor diet also increases the likelihood of aggressive behavior by altering brain function, which is a strong cause for the number one cause of death in African-American males aged 14 to 35 which is homicide, okay? Um, being murdered, shot, you know, just because people's brain chemistry is off because of that poor diet, they become more violent and don't know how to uh, vent that violence other than with a gun or a knife, you know? So this is a, this is a far reaching problem. This, this, this problem of poor diet is really, it's, it's destroying our neighbors, it's destroying um, destroying us as black people. But the good thing is that it's something that can be changed with a conscientious effort and enough push behind it to really get people to eat better. And something as simple as that, um, while it seems simple, it's it, the resources have to be there in order for it to happen, okay? But all this can be done, okay? And it needs to be done. Diet's more important than genetics because it's known that diet can change your genetic expression. So the genes are there, but the good part of the genes can be expressed with a good diet. The, the bad part of your genes, which lend more towards um, disease, will be expressed if the diet is poor. Okay, so uh, even if you have genes, say, and you have something that runs in your family, some disease that runs in your family, if you eat well, you can really prevent the expression of those bad genes, okay? So, and the good genes can be expressed that will keep you healthier. So we shouldn't feel that we're victims of our genes. We have much more control over our health than we don't have control over. I think there are more things that we can manipulate, particularly with diet and um, social interactions and our spirituality, then we can't. So I think that, that we are really still, even though the, the whole picture looks really abysmal, we have much more control over it than we realize. And that control needs to be exerted, okay? We're eating ourselves into a social crisis because we don't comprehend the fact that what we eat affects our brains, which affects our behavior and mental state. It's kind of a trickle down effect. I really like the, um, the uh, algorithm of diet at the top and diet changes your body, your body changes your brain and your brain changes your behavior. Okay, so it kind of filters down and depending on what kind of diet you're eating at the top will tell whether or not that filter as things filter down, whether things get better or worse for you. And like I said, Diet is either going to work towards your health or it's going to work against your health. It's not going to do both. It's not going to be neutral. It's not going to be, you know, back and forth. It's either helping you or it's hurting you. Okay. There's a great scripture that I like. Um, it's found in Isaiah 55 and 2. And it reads, why waste your money on what really isn't food? Why work hard for something that doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me and you will enjoy the very best food. So God knew we were going to have this issue and he's made provision for us to help us to be healthier as long as we're mindful of the choices that we need to make and we actually follow through with those choices. Okay, so very, very, very important. Okay, okay for us, um, a diet, what we really want to do, so... I want to talk about what constitutes a good diet, and what constitutes a poor diet. Okay. And it actually is very simple and is they're, they're perfectly diametrically opposed. Okay. For us, a good diet is one that is as pictured here on the, on the left on the slide. It's a diet that is, has high, what we call a high nutrient density. Okay. What I mean by high nutrient density is that those are foods that have high vitamin and mineral content, but low calorie content. Okay, remember calories, if they build up enough 
and you consume enough of them, they're gonna, and you don't burn them, you're gonna become obese, get overweight, get sick, affect your mental status, affect every part of your body. So what you want to do is you want to eat a diet that for ounce for ounce gives you more nutrient um, content, higher nutrient value and lower caloric content. And the way you do that is primarily through a plant-based diet. Okay, and we have that pictured here. Um, not a vegetarian diet per se, but plant-based, meaning that half of your plate is going to be fruits and vegetables. Roughly a quarter of your plate can be uh, a low fat animal protein and the other quarter can be whole grains. Okay, this is how we need to eat. Okay, this is a good, a great mnemonic that I like to use for what things to eat is G-bombs. It's the letter G, a space, then B-O-M-B-S. Okay, what that stands for, the G is for greens. The first B is for uh, berries. The O is for onions. The M is for mushrooms. Uh, the second B is for, goodness, I'm blanking on the second B. I'll remember it. Um, but, and the S is for seeds. Okay, so uh, berries. Yeah, berry, B, the first B is berries. The second B is, um, huh, yeah, there you go. There you go. Beans, that's what yeah. it was. See, that's okay. <laughs> Maybe we didn't get water or something. The brain is, was freezing. <laughs> you that's need right. the visual help. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. You bailed me out. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't remember beans for some reason. I love beans. I couldn't remember it. But this is what, this is what constitutes a nutrient-dense diet. OK, and this is the type of diet that you really want to make sure that certainly at least half to three quarters of your plate is going to be every day. You want to have be composed of these types of foods because these foods provide you with low calories, but very high vitamin and mineral content. This is what your cells need to survive. This is what your cells need to function properly. OK, this is the type of food that you want to make a habit out of eating and you can certainly make small changes. It's not that you have to make, um, you know, uh, wholesale changes, sweeping changes all at one time. Um, but the thing is you want to be constantly kind of moving yourself towards those types of foods and away from the high fatty foods. So what constitutes a poor diet? What constitutes a poor diet is the exact opposite of what constitutes a, a good diet, meaning foods that are high in calorie content, high in fat, salt, sugar, but low in nutrient value, low in vitamins and minerals, okay? So you're basically talking about fast food, um, processed foods that come in a box, um, things that have, basically when a food is processed, it means the nutrient value, the vitamins and minerals are taken out of it, okay? Um, what you, the best way to know what foods to, to stick with primarily is to look at your supermarket. All supermarkets are set up this way. Around the perimeter of the supermarket, the outer, outer aisles is where the healthy food is. That's where the nutrient-dense foods are, okay? When you walk down the aisles, the individual aisles, that's where processed food tends to be. Those are the foods that you want to minimize because those are foods that have been robbed of their nutrient value. They're all just sugar, salt, fat, um, empty calories that we call. You know, they're just calories that just sit in your system, make you sick. They don't contribute to the functioning of your cells. They don't provide the vitamins and the minerals that your cells need in order to, um, to produce energy and to keep you well and keep you functioning well. Okay, so basically a nutrient poor diet starves your cells. And if your cells starve, guess what? You starve. And when you starve, the way the body demonstrates that starvation is through organ failure. In this, in this particular case, what we're talking about today is specifically the failure of the nervous system and the brain to really function properly and, 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 um, and serve us the way it should, okay? Now, a big problem for us also is food addiction, okay? Sugar in particular is very, very addicting. It, it has, it's, it's, it's the same centers in your brain that make heroin appealing or the same centers in your brain that make sugar appealing. But the problem is that sugar is multiple times more addicting than heroin is. Okay. 
and that's a twofold problem because one, it's more addicting, and two, it's more available than heroin and less expensive. I mean, it's easier to go in a store, a supermarket, buy a five pound bag of sugar than it is to go out in the street and buy some heroin. It's easier and it's cheaper. So this is a big problem. That that sugar content in the diet is really, really wrecking havoc with our community. Okay, the brain becomes dependent on it and is always looking for more, just like a drug. Okay, so that's why the more sugar to eat, that you eat, the more sugar you're gonna want. And it just keeps going around and around and around, okay? The cycle can be broken with healthy foods that will nourish the brain by giving it proper vitamins and minerals that it needs to be healthy. Because remember, one of the things that happens is when you eat a poor diet, you again, you become nutrient deficient. The thing is the body is not really craving the sugar, it's actually craving the B vitamins that are in the sugar but there's so little B vitamin in the sugar that to get this much B vitamin, you gotta eat a five pound bag of sugar to get that little tiny amount of, sugar, of, of B vitamin. So you're overeating, you're not really wanting to, the body doesn't really want the sugar, it wants the minerals and vitamins that are in the sugar, but it's such a small amount, you end up eating a lot of it, okay? So that's where sugar cravings come from. So clearly the answer to sugar cravings is to just eat a better diet that's more nutrient dense with the vitamins and minerals that the body's looking for, then it won't need to crave the sugar because it's getting the vitamins and minerals from the food, the healthy food, the G-bombs that you're eating. And you'll find that the, 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 those sugar cravings will disappear with an adequate diet, okay? The sad part really is that the food industry understands that food addiction all too well and that fast foods and processed foods are made with chemicals that reinforce the food addiction. Okay, so it's it's a plan. It's, it's a it's a conspiracy um, to to basically to destroy the black community. It really is. It's a, it's a it's a, it's a it's a, it's a, um, a conspiracy to destroy mankind, but particularly the black community. We're really we're really the focus of this whole thing, and we really need to be aware of that. We need to open our eyes and understand that we need to understand all the forces that are acting against us so that we can act against those forces. We don't want to be ignorant of this stuff. Okay. Um, the food industry pushes foods that are of low, low nutrient and high caloric content, i.e. fast food, uh, to make our children heavier and sicker so that they will need medications, which will make drug companies rich at our expense. And the fact is when you take these drugs, they're not they can help with symptoms, but they're never going to help the actual problem. The underlying problem is still there. The under, underlying problem is a cellular issue because those cells are being starved by a poor diet. Okay, When that diet becomes more nutrient dense, we start feeding the body the way it should, the body will correct itself. The body doesn't want to be sick. The body doesn't want to have problems. Okay, It's going to fight like crazy to try to keep itself balanced out. But the problem is, if it doesn't have what it needs to do that, it can only do it for so long and for so well, okay? You have to feed the body. If you give the body what it needs, it will take care of itself, okay? Because it knows what to do with these nutrients. The nutrients need to be provided. So if these nutrients aren't provided, we have an issue. But if they are provided, health can soar. You know, health can greatly improve and greatly increase and we won't be so victims, uh, won't be victimized by these forces that are coming against us, okay? Poor diets also decrease the nutrients and chemicals in the brain, like GABA, which is a, new, a neurotransmitter, glycine is an amino acid, taurine is another amino acid, melatonin is a hormone, and vitamin B6. Vitamin B6, the vitamin B, the B vitamins are critical for neurologic function, okay? And when this, when these nutrients uh, become deficient, um, the nervous system is struggles because it runs, the nervous system runs on B vitamins and you get large numbers of B vitamins from the G bombs. And this is what nourishes it. But um, when, you, when you don't have enough of these nutrients, the system becomes imbalanced. And anytime the body's imbalanced, it's gonna be sick, okay? Imbalance is illness, balance is health. So the whole idea is to get the body back back where it needs to be, back, on, back on, on track here, okay? When you have the deficiency of things like GABA and glycine and taurine, melatonin, B6, it makes the brain imbalanced, and that basically leads to mental illness and sleep problems, okay? So basically, the poor diet is just setting us up. 
The poor diets, accumula poor diets cause accumulation of toxins in our bodies, which can affect all organs, including the brain. Okay, but the brain, the reason why it affects the brain preferentially is because all your nutrients that you eat in your body always go to your brain first. Your nervous system gets fed first. Your nervous system gets first dibs on all of your nutrition, then whatever is left goes to the rest of your body. So this makes it even more important and more critical that what you eat be the proper types of foods because those nutrients are going to your nervous system and your brain first, okay? Toxins are mainly cleared from the body, but when we, when we are cleared from the body when we fast. But the problem is, again, too, is that we tend to eat constantly, too. When we eat constantly, we don't give the body a chance to clear toxins out. So it's, it's, a, it's really, it's, it's a vicious cycle, like I said, because with, with the, the foods, the poor, the poor foods that we eat, they, because, they cause nutrient deficiencies. So the body will tend to eat more food because it's looking for more nutrients. It's not really looking for more food, it's looking for more nutrients. But as long as the diet is nutrient deficient, you have to eat a, a truckload of you know, Popeyes to get enough vitamin B to, to run your nervous system. So before you know it, you're obese, your vitamin B deficiency, your vitamin B deficient, your nervous system is not working right, you're depressed, you're anxious. Um, and putting yourself more at risk for things like coronary artery disease, diabetes, and so forth. So that diet really has to be pristine, has to be working for you, okay? Very, very critical, okay? High sugar content in diets can cause steady brain damage over time, which increase the risk of mental illness, violence, and crime, okay? In fact, societal issues show a direct correlation with the amount of diabetes in a given community, regardless of socioeconomic class. So again, that, that sugar is a, is a key thing, a key um, um, detractor of our, of our health. It also goes to, goes also to speak, uh, goes to, um, that we don't have to say really that um, it's not only sugar, but it's also salt and also fat. So high salt content, high fat content really can cause issues as well, okay? Now, all of our um, mental illnesses can be based in, um, they're related to, to low micronutrient, um, vi uh, which are vitamins and, vitamins and minerals, low omega-3 fats, and low phytonutrients, which are nutrients that are found in vegetables and fruit. So depression, anger, anxiety, and sadness all increase when these nutrients are not available. Okay, a recent poll actually shows that 69% of Americans are angry. You know, there's enough reason to be angry now, but you know, before, even before COVID, the anger was very high. And a lot of it just has to do with nervous irritability. Nervous irritability comes from an underfed, malnourished nervous system, malnourished brain. Okay, it just makes the brain irritable. And it shows us irritability in the form of depression, anxiety, and so forth. Okay, it makes us uh, much more susceptible to uh, to all these illnesses. Now, some sobering facts: um, one in eight adolescents are depressed, which is crazy. I mean, when you're an adolescent, that should be one of the most fun times of your life. You shouldn't have to be worrying about the possibility of being depressed. It may actually even be more than one in eight now. This was kind of an older study. Uh, depression is the leading cause of debility in children. You're kidding? I mean, children, why are children having such a hard time with depression? I mean, you would think that children are going to be more carefree and, you know, everything's going to be, you know, just fun for them, that that should be a fun time in their life, but they're actually having to deal a lot with depression, okay? Four million children, four million ages six to 12 are on psychotropic drugs. And this, this is not right, again, because this is the time of life when you really should be relatively carefree and, um, and doing well. You know, you shouldn't have to be worrying about taking psychotropic drugs for some mental illness. But again, it all boils down uh, to a large extent through because of their diets. And their diets just being poor and not giving the body what it needs, having, having the cells of the nervous system just being just malnourished irritable and showing themselves as these as these uh, chronic kind of uh, mental illnesses. 
the importance of a healthy diet has been long known. Um, even a classic example, believe it or not, Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler was a vegetarian, okay? Or actually he was a vegan. And because he was, he was scared to death of getting sick. He had a, a tremendous fear of cancer and getting sick. So even he knew in his little deranged mind that a, a vegan uh, or a, at least a plant-based diet was beneficial. So <laughs> yeah, he was mean, he was very mean. Um, and the, the funny part about it too is that he had a Jewish doctor. You remember he was putting, he was sending all Jews to the gas chamber and all that stuff. He had a Jewish doctor because the Jewish doctor understood the importance of, of diet in health. So he let this guy live. He didn't send him to a concentration camp. He actually let this guy be his doctor. Okay, so that just shows you, you know, how important this type of diet um, of really, really is. Now, the number one, just again, talking about uh, medications in kids, um, the number one class of medication prescribed for children are anti-anxiety meds. And this is not because they should be anxious because that's, that's the innocent time of life is because they're not being fed right. It's because their nervous system is not being fed and it's showing itself as anxiety. That irritability that that nutrient deficient nervous system is showing is anxiety. Again, if that diet is changed around, the sugar is decreased, the fats decreased, the salts decreased, the nutrients, the vitamins and minerals and, and, and fiber and, and phytochemicals, phytonutrients is increased with the G-bombs diet, that will all turn around. You know, they're not gonna need to be on all these medications. The medications aren't helping anything because they're helping, they're diminishing, they're diminishing symptoms, but they're still eating Popeyes, they're still eating McDonald's, they're still eating Burger King, they're still not feeding their cells right. Medications don't feed cells, okay? Medications temper down symptoms, okay? So the disease process still marches on. The, the, the child may, may appear better for a short time because the medications are kind of tamping down the symptoms, but eventually if that poor diet continues, their nervous system is gonna still continue to deteriorate and eventually it's gonna, de it's gonna minimize or totally obscure the effectiveness of the medication. And that's why sometimes you know, medication doses have to be increased constantly all the time or new medications have to be added or one medication has to be switched out for another one is because the underlying cause just isn't being addressed. That poor diet is not being taken care of. The poor diet is still there and no medication is gonna overcome that. The only thing that overcomes that is a better diet, a healthy diet that's gonna drive you towards health and away from illness, okay? You ever see that commercial where, the Snickers commercial where the person's like irritable and then they eat the Snickers bar and they're better? That actually is, is a falsehood because what happens is, yeah, you love that commercial. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but the problem with that commercial is that the Snickers bar is actually causing the problem. The Snickers bar causes that person to be irritable. It doesn't help them. It doesn't stop the irritability. That's false advertising. Because what happens is when they eat that Snickers bar, what happens is their sugar level shoots way up, okay? Because there's sugar in the candy bar. So the sugar level shoots way up, the insulin level shoots up, to pull the sugar down, the insulin pulls the sugar down too far and that's when they get irritable, okay? So if they hadn't eaten the Snickers bar and done that load of sugar in their system, they wouldn't have had the insulin spike and they wouldn't have dropped the sugar and gotten more irritable. So in actuality, the Snickers bar is causing the irritability, it's not fixing the irritability. So that's actually kind of a um, little false advertising there. But again, you see what the problem is, is that it's encouraging people to think that, oh, if I eat a Snickers bar, I'm gonna be better, I'm gonna be more, you know, my, my mood's gonna be better. So they eat more Snickers bars, they eat more sugar and they, you know, perpetuate the problem. So you gotta be, you gotta be really informed and be knowledgeable of what foods are doing to you and not believe every advertisement that you see because they're only interested in selling their product. They're not interested in, in how healthy you are. They don't care. They just, want to, they just want to sell Snickers bars. They don't care that 70% of the country's overweight, 35% of the country's obese, they don't care. They want to sell candy bars, you know, and we can't fall prey to that. Okay, knowledge is what keeps us from bad food choices. Okay, what you eat either makes you healthier or sicker. There's no in between. 
Now, <clears throat> specifically, um, as far as brain function goes, what nutrients are we actually looking for, okay, to, to actually help us, okay? Um, Omega-3 fatty acids are very critical for, um, for brain health and brain function, okay? Um, the brain is made primarily of fat. You know, somebody calls you a fathead, they're right, you know, because your, your brain is made of fat. But you have to have the right amount of fat, right types of fat in your system, okay? What's the right type of fat, right? There are three different types of omega-3 fatty acids that are critical in the diet. There's omega-3s, there's omega-6s, and there's omega-9s, okay? Omega-6s and omega-9s are plentiful in the diet, okay? Omega-3s omega are the ones that get deficient if you're eating a poor diet. Diet-wise, you get omega-3 fatty acids from fatty fish like salmon as good fat. Not, when I say fatty, I don't mean fried stuff. I mean fatty fish that has healthy fat in it. Salmon, mackerel, sardines, these types of fish are, um, have high amounts of omega-3 fatty acids. The problem what happens is with the poor diets that we tend to eat in our communities um, is that we get tons of, of omega-6s and omega-9s, but not enough threes. The optimal ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 is about four to one. You should have about four times as much omega-6s in your diet as omega-3s. as omega -3s. That's healthy. The problem with the typical diet in the black community is that, and the foods that we eat, is that that ratio becomes 25 to 1. So we have 25 times as much omega-6s as we have omega-3s. And that's not good for brain function. It's not giving the brain enough omega-3s to really balance itself out so it can work properly. So that balance needs to be really, needs to be fixed. It can be fixed with, again, the G-bombs diet, okay? Um, the, the, as, we, as we have more uh, omega-6s in our system, it makes, us, makes our rates of Alzheimer's and dementia go up, okay? So this is more of a chronic thing over time, but still it's gonna cause that issue. Again, all health changes don't happen right away. They happen over time. Okay, so if you're doing the wrong things for a long enough period of time, eventually those habits are going to catch up with you and start to, uh, to take your health down and make it, um, you know, make it more difficult for you. Okay, B vitamins, so omega-3 fatty acids are very important. So you can get them through the fatty fish. You can also take them as a supplement. Okay, it's sometimes good to supplement. Well, I suggest supplementing. Uh, with fish oil because that way you know you're getting a certain amount of fish oil every day even if for a particular day you may not eat fish or you may not eat fish for for several days or maybe only once a week and not get enough omega-3s from your diet at least if you take it as a supplement you can get omega-3 fatty acids from fish oil on a daily basis that will help with the uh the nervous system and the brain the other nutrient that i think is very key as i said before is the b vitamins the b vitamins or what the nervous system runs on, okay? There are nine different B vitamins, okay? There's you know B1, B2, B3, B6, B5, B12, folate, riboflavin. Um, so the key to taking B vitamins is not to take just one of them. The key to taking B vitamins is to take them as a complex. You wanna take all your B vitamins, if you take them as a supplement, now you can get B vitamins from whole grains and um, you know fruits and vegetables. That's your primary source. But again, I suggest supplementing as well uh, because that way you know that you're getting a certain amount of B vitamins every day, regardless of how you may eat on a certain day. Uh, but you want to take them as a B complex, meaning all nine B vitamins are in that tablet. The reason you do that is because they all get absorbed through the same pathway in your cells. So if, say you were to take a vitamin B12 by itself you would overwhelm the, the, um, the cell's absorption of B12. It would just be absorbing all B12 and there wouldn't be enough room for the other B vitamins to get absorbed. They would be crowded out because the, the system is overwhelmed with B by, of B12. So the thing to do is you take it as a B complex. So all nine B vitamins get absorbed into your cells at the same time. So all nine of your B vitamin levels can come up, nourish the nervous system, keep it nice and calm and keep it functioning efficiently and energetically. And that way you decrease your risk of depression, anxiety, and you probably see those things. If you have those conditions, you probably see them improve. Your sleep would improve, your energy level will improve also. 
So omega-3s, B-complex. And finally, I would suggest um, even just a multivitamin. A regular multivitamin has a little bit of everything in it because multivitamin really is kind of the foundation anyway, but it will also give you adequate amounts of antioxidant vitamins like vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E. Um, and those antioxidants are very critical for any organ system in the body, nervous system, any system, but they keep the free radicals from attacking your system. Um, those things can really cause a lot of damage to your health. So for mental health, my top three um, supplements, if you can take supplements, would be a multivitamin, a B-complex, and omega-3 fatty acid or fish oil. Okay, so those, those will work well for you. Okay, um, remember a malnourished brain sets you up for things, it sets you up for multiple things, drug addiction, anxiety, depression, all those things. So as we nourish and feed our brains, we really d diminish the chances of developing these kind of mental health issues. And the school to prison pipeline starts with nutrition, okay? So nutrition has got to be paramount and really has to, um, to um, be taken seriously. And um, as long as it gets into the right, right frame and as long as we, we start to eat properly, we'll be able to start to stem the tide of this downward spiral of, ment of, of poor mental health in our communities. The mental health will, will improve and we'll start seeing less and less anxiety, depression, um, violent crime, homicide, suicide. I mean, we need to really take stock in that. And really, and really it starts with that, that better diet. The better diet is the key. It's going to be the key to better school performance. It's going to be the key to better disposition. Um, you know, just more agreeable personalities. You know, and um, the key thing too is to remember that that the nutrition, as we talked about with the pre-pregnant women, it starts long before conception. You know, it's important for us to eat properly all the time. Okay, from birth on. You know, we really have to be able to to eat. Um, healthy. That way, we have we'll we'll give rise to healthy offspring. Teach them to eat well. They'll eat well through their lives. They'll give rise to healthy offspring, and so forth. And it just gradually it will just increase our our level of health um, in our community, mental health wise. Okay. Remember, life begets life. So you want to eat live foods, not dead foods. The G bombs, the plant based diet, is a live diet. The fast food, processed food diet is a dead diet that will only beget death. Okay, so over time is what you do over time that really matters. And doing the right things long enough, you'll get the results that you're looking for. So we must eat live food uh, in order for us to be healthy. Okay, so I think that's my presentation. And I guess I'll turn it back over to Roxana or Andrea and uh, see if there's any questions of anybody. So I know Roxana will probably, um, first, first of all, thank you so much. I was, uh, I was like this the whole time, right? And so, um, but I know Roxana has questions and I think she even has um, a thing a, a, like a, a baby quiz that she's gonna do. But you you raise a couple of of important issues and i like um i i, I just like to um to just sort of bring them up one of the things you talked about was this notion of high level of childhood obesity right so but you mentioned earlier about food deserts and so i i am i struggle with i'm in full agreement we've talked about food food deserts um you know some of us at the job have been um, trying our hand at growing herbs and vegetables and some other things. <clears throat> but I struggle with, you know, where should, I mean, where, where can people go when you're in a food desert, right? So I want to, I want to, I want to, um, I want to make sure my grandchildren have the right things, but what does that really look like if I don't have access to a quality grocery store? What are my other options? <clears throat> um, because, you know, I think, People want to do better in some instances. I just think based on <clears throat> based on propaganda, based on these number of other things that you've mentioned. So any any suggestions or thoughts about you know where where can people start in instances like that? 
Well, I think I think you raised one one good viable solution there is to try to start growing your own food. You know, even if you just get you know um, plant boxes and just start to try to grow your own. Um, but again, it's tough to do because if if people don't really have transportation and things like that to get out of their neighborhoods to go other places where there are supermarkets, that will be the next viable solution. Um, then it just it makes it tough. I mean, I think ultimately we need to find ways to get the food to the people um, and just get the supermarkets in the neighborhoods. OK, we can't just constantly kind of, you know, put the stress on people to have to move or leave out of their neighborhoods to go other neighborhoods to get their food. We have to find ways to get the food, bring the food to the people, um, you know, and I'm sure it can be done. I mean, there's nothing that can't be done. I love that. So, I mean, that's helpful. And Roxanne, I just have another comment. Um, and then I know you have uh, lots of questions. Uh, folk have been, there's just been a flurry in the, in the chat throughout. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's always this conversation um, in, in, in uh, the black community or in communities of color that where it is too expensive to eat healthy. And so I contend it really is too expensive not to. Right. But how do we convince people? I mean, and I'm not talking about those who live in a food desert. I'm talking about those who, um, you know, have have um, the opportunity to eat better. How do we convince them? Like what what should messaging be like, especially in this year of, you know, you talked about stress. You talked about a number of things. But when I think about um, this year of heightened everything, you know, heightened racism, heightened anxiety, all of that. So what can we do to convince the folk who can do better to do better? Well, I think that the, the key thing really is that we have to really um, stress that health is something that has to be built and it's not something that happens overnight. And the things that we have to un understand that the things we do now are things that are gonna impact our health 20 years from now. OK, and um, you have to think you have to be forward thinking. You can't just think of, OK, you know, it, the food is more expensive. I'm just going to eat junk food because it's cheaper. You have to think down the road. What's it, what what's going to happen if you continue to eat junk food? You have to think about, you know, food as an investment in your health. You have to think about what's going to happen to you 20 years down the road. So if you take, you know, you remember like you might remember those old Fram oil filter commercials where the guy is his car breaks down because he didn't change his oil and the mechanic comes on and he's holding the, the Fram oil filter. He says, you can pay me now. You know, he looks at the filter or pay me later. And he looks at the car just totally blowing up on the side of the road. And that's how you have to really think about this sort of thing. You have to think that what you're trying to do with your diet is you're trying to build something. And it takes time, it's gonna take some sacrifice, it may take a little bit more expense, but when you think about how much money you're gonna save by being healthy 20 years from now, as opposed to being going to the ICU every other week, it makes a lot of sense. You know, there's a lot of pain and suffering and illness. You know, if you go to the doctor's office, you have to pay multiple hundreds of dollars for prescriptions because you're sick, because you didn't eat right for your whole life. You know, that's gonna be more expensive on the back end, you're going to be paying more money on the back end if you eat unhealthy. It's better to pay more money now, get a better diet, than to try to eat than to eat lousy food, saving money, and then on the back end you get sicker and have thousands and thousands of dollars of medical bills. Not only, you know, it's not only just physical issues, but it's also going to be mental and emotional stressors on you too. So. You have to put, sense. yeah, yeah. You just have to, you just have to think of it that way. You have to think of it that you're doing something for the future, and it may take some sacrifice now, but the sacrifice is going to be more than worth it. Great, thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Roxana, but just for the record, everybody on the uh, are joining us, he asked me if I remember that commercial. No, that seems way too old. <laughs> Maybe I dated myself with that one. <laughs> <laughs> We have a lot of questions in the chat. Right. Um, right. Sharice, she had a comment, and I have a question about this as well. I never thought about cookware affecting my diet. I use a cast iron pot 
um, pan and stovetop cast iron grill quite frequently. So um, one of the images that we had shared had said that um, it's one of the things that can affect our brain. Um, do you, can, can you give us any, um, so this is, this is a slide that she's referring to how it has brain um, threats on yeah. here. And I thought cast iron was better than the, um, the, 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 the Teflon kind of pans because once they get um, scratched, they start leaking the, met, the toxic metals, but I thought iron was okay. So we both had um, that question. Yeah, iron's an issue. Iron's an issue because when you cook with it, it, it leaches the iron out into the food. And that's, that's the problem is an iron overload in the body can really affect the nervous system. Okay, so that's, that's what's going on there. I'm not, I'm not certain about the Teflon, um, if it breaks down. Um, but um, yeah, the iron definitely we have documented that it's not good. That oh, wow. the oh, wow. iron is a neurotoxin if it's if it's just absorbed into the body too much. Hmm. Okay. So we we so we should like limit, I guess, how um, and think about that when we're preparing our foods, not yeah. to cook everything. Um, maybe eat some things that are um, raw. Is that, raw or is lightly, that or lightly steamed, you can get you can get a steamer and lightly steam your vegetables, okay. that sort of thing. So Look yeah, so that's her head. Steam. She probably already does that. that. <laughs> <laughs> you can also you can juice things too. I mean, you could you can get a juicer and juice your fruits and vegetables. Um, so that way, I mean, you never want to overcook your food anyway because the one of the benefits of fruits and vegetables is the phytonutrients that are in contained in them. Phyto just means plant, so if plant nutrients in the fruits and vegetables. And obviously if you overcook anything, you're gonna kill those, the nutrients, you're gonna kill the enzymes that are healthy in those foods. So you never really wanna cook your food to death. You, you wanna lightly steam it or eat it raw. That's Preferably. good, that's good information. Um, so someone is asking about the presentation. It will be available on Facebook and we're trying to combine, um, compile the presentations and the notes to send out to everyone. So that, so keep a lookout for that. Um, so our next question from um, Lynn, I don't like mushrooms. What can I replace them with and stay compliant with the G-bombs? Well, the thing is the G-bombs is flexible. It's not that you have to eat everything in the G-bombs if there's a food that okay. you don't particularly like. I mean, I have patients that, or people that say they don't like beans. I say, well, that's fine. You don't have to eat the beans. I mean, you're still gonna be compliant um, if you eat the other other four things on a regular basis, if there's one that you don't like, then that's that's not really going to affect you too much. Um, the key thing is just don't replace the mushrooms with you know fried chicken or something like that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then um, you had answered this already about um, the omega threes and six and supplements, and then you also gave us that you want us to do a multivitamin vitamin. Um, the fish oil and the B complex. The B. Right. Um, so someone also asked, what are free radicals? Free radicals are compounds that are, that are generated just by normal cellular activity. As cells create energy, they're almost like the exhaust that a car makes. You know, the car runs and the energy, the, the engine runs, but it also puts out a waste material like the exhaust. So as, as cells have their normal energy producing machinery rolling, those free radicals get expelled out and they need to be neutralized because if too much, it's just like if you start a car, you run it and the, the, the smoke from the tailpipe comes out and you know your garage is closed, it's gonna choke you. You have to get rid of that somehow. So the same thing you have to do is get rid of the free radicals that the, that the cells produce and neutralize those. You don't want to necessarily have to neutralize all of them. Some free radicals are important to have because, or a small amount is important to have because it just pushes the system along and it helps to generate energy. You just don't want an overabundance of free radicals. Then those free radicals are what get neutralized when you take a multivitamin because a multivitamin has antioxidants in them to prevent the free radicals from forming. 
Um, I saw Andre was about to say. Yeah, this I actually I know you have more questions, but two, two things. Uh, there's something else I want to raise. You, you, I put it in the chat. You didn't say it quite this way, but uh, talked about this larger strategy, right, to get us off our game and to kill us. And so I really feel like this, the whole this, this is more than just like the new sexy thing, right? It's bigger than that. I'd love to figure out how, and we won't solve it today, but how we message so that this becomes a real movement. Because I mean, that, that, I mean that's just one of the strategies to set us up. I, I shared with the team, my son goes, to this particular school where my son goes, I drop him off. And when I used to work downtown, I would head downtown where, well, some of the neighborhoods where I go through were really poor. All the billboards were either a fast food or a liquor, right, mm -hmm. or cigarettes. So I really would like to, um, you know, to, to and again, we don't have to have the conversation now, but figure out how you and some of your colleagues and some of us in the mental health arena really can have a, a larger conversation about messaging that this too is a strategy designed to kill us. Um, Not right. And I mean, it, and we, I'm not even talking about conspiracy theorists, but I am talking about how do we, how do we help you and others and ourselves, like really make this a movement? Mm -hmm. That would be excellent. That would be that. That's what we need. We need something that's got to have some teeth in it, so that we can get some, get some traction and start making some changes. You know, and and that's that's going to be the, that's going to be the key. So I, I, I think at some point, and again, we don't, I know that there's lots of, uh, lots of people, folk have lots of questions and I, but I think we should at some point uh, give some real thought to a call to action as it relates to, to our, our health and our body and our mind and our food. So that's what I wanted to say, Roxanne, thanks. And I think um, that's like the not sexy thing. The back part of that is like really talking about nutrition and mental health and those are things people don't want to talk about but we as a community need to make it important and um really make that part of our initiative because just to think of so many so many of the things that are affecting us are by the choices that we're making um that's really disheartening um so back to the chat mr yep. barry said oh I'm sorry i don't want to know i just don't want to forget this and and I don't know if anybody heard that number. You said something yeah. like insane, like four, blah, blah, blah. I wrote it down. Four, did you say four million children or four? You said four million, six to yeah. 12 yeah. on yeah. Psychotro psychotropic drugs, right? If that's not enough to make us like the thought that, you know, I, I'm a long way away from that. Um, a bit of my grandchildren being impacted by that or my nieces and my nephews, or, but not even anybody I know, but generations yet unborn that we've mm -hmm. not put systems in place so that they, so, okay, I'm really going on mute this time. No, I, I definitely understand. It's upsetting to me. And that's why I knew I had to bring Dr. Um, Halstead to this platform because when I heard it at the youth summit, I, I I think the information like you can kind of know things, but that it really pierced my heart that I we need to get this message out. Um, mm -hmm. Mr. Barry had said Baltimore has a great Afro vegan society, so I'll post that in the notes for resources. Um, they have classes on how to cook on a budget, and I think that's so important um, when you're starting out a new um, habit is to really have those supports there, whether it's fasting. Um, trying, Andrea is my resource now, <laughs> or trying to um, not eat as much meat, like not, not just, you know, having that support system there. Um, oh, I put this in the chat about food deserts. Um, there was a good article, so I'll also share that out to everyone. Um, Dr. Halstead, what is your opinion about manosteen tea for various ailments? That was asked by Sh Shania. Mangosteen, yeah, mangosteen, mangosteen is fine. Mangosteen is, um, it's a fruit base, um, but yeah, that has this very, it's, it's again, it's a, it's a, a plant-based, fruit-based type sup, um, tea supplement, but it also helps to neutralize free radicals. Uh, so very, it can be very beneficial, yep. 
So Roxanne, we oh, see in the chat, oh no no did you see in the chat um uh someone talked about a challenge maybe you hadn't gotten to that but no i was i didn't expect so much feedback we got a lot <laughs> i don't know i'm gonna try to hurry up and go through okay. everyone needs to know a farmer um we have a pastor that we partnered with that is doing farming in um through his church can you say his name real quick andrea yeah, dr herbert brown dr herbert brown um how does keto fit in this is from lashana how does keto fit in i know a lot of people on high fat diets yeah i'm not personally i'm not really a big fan of a lot of extreme things and sometimes what happens is with some of these diets like the keto and and atkins and different types of things you know, all diets work. All diets work to a certain extent. The issue that you have to ask is if you're on that diet for a long period of time, are you going to start robbing your body of something that it needs, some essential nutrient? I'm more a fan of just eating a whole food plant-based diet rather than, than sticking myself into saying, okay, I have to eat high carb or high protein or low fat. You know, you get, you get really kind of preoccupied with these types of diets and what you're eating and counting calories and all that stuff, it just makes it more arduous. The key thing to me is just to make good food choices and eat everything, eat your food in moderation and just not really get so bent out of shape or so concerned about, am I eating too much protein? Am I eating too many carbs? I'm not, you know, am I getting enough of this, getting enough of that? It just makes you, it, it makes, it actually can kind of, kind of be counterproductive because it just makes you think too much you don't want to get to the point where you're thinking too much about your diet. You want to be thinking enough that it's healthy and that you get that you do it long enough so that becomes a part of you. But you don't really want to like get really, really stuck on being really restrictive because those types of diets can be more, um, you know, more um, arresting than they are freedom producing. Dr. Hall said, I love that scripture from Isaiah that you say about not spending money on things that um that are not going to make you full and i think a lot of that is people trying not being mindful of if they're really hungry and just eating just to eat and being that that preoccupation with the food which mm -hmm. is not um but like it's other things there that are making them hungry and making them crave it like maybe oh it made me feel good for five minutes or whatever so. right right um so the other dr loretta halstead <laughs> She said, start to utilize our churches as, as resources, resource centers through partnerships with community gardens markets or each, each, one, each one teach one. So that's a good one. Um, Ms. Joyce said, community gardens are a good idea. Ms. Shania again, what is your, oh, okay, we already did this, the Mag Magnestine. Uh, I'm looking for the next question, I'm sorry. Oh, Ms. Shanice had asked, what cookware can we use? Do you have any cookware um, recommendations? Um, I was, I would say stainless steel is probably, probably going to be the safest. I mean, okay. the iron you kind of want to stay away from, but the stainless, stainless steel is probably going to be probably the best. Um, I'm allergic to, let's see. I, I can't see the name. I'm allergic to tree nuts, almonds, pecans, walnuts. Is there an alternative? alternative um in that case i mean I, I would think you probably would to be on the safe side you may want to just avoid the nuts altogether because you can get cross reactivity with different types of nuts and you just it's not worth it trying to eat nuts at the risk of getting an allergic reaction so you may want to just try to maybe try try using try eating seeds instead of nuts you know, seeds and nuts are different things so maybe try eating seeds instead and just avoid the nuts just to be on the safe side um, before the possible movement, young people and old need to know how important they are, how they need to value themselves, love themselves, et cetera. This needs to be tied into their overall well-being. And that's from L. I, I don't know. I, it's not showing your whole name here, Ms. Mr. or Mrs. L. Um, so scrolling down. Hey, Ms. Cheryl. Cheryl, nutrients on wheels could be could be we get if we get the word out about meals. Um, Barry again with bvsmd.org. That's the Black Vegan Society. So Barry, I'll just share that out with everyone. Still scrolling down. Um, 
Thank you, Miss Joy. She said we have a really awesome platform. We're still, oh, Barry is saying seeds. So I guess like sunflower seeds are a good one. Okay. Um, and that's all I have for right now. But then for the question and answer, we have two good ones that I saw. Did How does this information up? apply or are there d any differences for women trying to conceive? Um, no, not really any difference. I mean, I think that really what we talked about today, it goes for everybody. Okay. Right. Everybody needs to have that whole food basis, that whole, whole food plant-based basis to get the vitamins, minerals, nutrients that they need at the high, high level of nutrients, low levels of calories. Um, so yeah, I mean that eating that way is good for anybody, male, female, you know, anybody, child. Um, so this is another good one. And I have um, a few family members that have this issue. How does this information apply? Or are there different differences for people suffering from endocrine or ho hormonal issues, such as polycystic ovarian syndrome? And so I know um, a lot of people on YouTube are recommending keto, but um, I thought the same thing of how can eating meat and fat be helpful in the long run. Maybe it can fix it to begin with. So um, if you could answer that, that a little yeah. bit. One of the big things with polycystic ovarian syndrome is that they have a high risk of diabetes. So I could see why you know they would want to stick with low carbohydrate. I think really the, the key is going to be to eat the right types of carbohydrates and the plant-based diet is going to give you the right type. It's going to give you the complex carbohydrates, which isn't going to um, hurt you. What hurts you is the simple sugars. The simple sugars are things that come from candy and cakes and pies, ice cream, whereas the complex carbohydrates that you get from fruits and vegetables, the you know, larger molecules, they're also in there with the fiber of the fruit and the vegetables. So as the, the carbohydrate gets broken down slowly, it doesn't absorb as quickly as the, the simple carbohydrates because of the fiber in there. So the, the plant-based diet really, really works across the board. I mean, I don't know of any condition that it's not going to help. So the key thing there is to, if you're dealing with anything with uh, polycystic um, ovarian syndrome is to make sure you minimize the, 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 the intake of, of simple sugars, but the, the, the plant-based diet should still work for you. And then there was another question about what about the importance of vitamin D? Vitamin D is a big one. Yeah, actually, um, it's big. It's actually kind of gotten more notoriety lately because of COVID and the vitamin D. And vitamin D helps with the immune system, helps with immune function. And the, the other problem is that most people are vitamin D deficient. You know, um, when I was in practice, I would go ahead and check vitamin D levels on everybody, and virtually everybody had low vitamin D levels. I very rarely saw anybody with an a adequate vitamin D level. The normal range that the lab gives is between 30 and 100. I would always try to make sure that, that people had their ranges up about 75 to 80, up closer to that high end of normal, but most of them would come in in the teens and 20s. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is people tend to spend more time indoors, so they're not outside in the sun. And also their diets being deficient as they are, they don't have enough vitamin D in their diets. So, but vitamin D is really critical. It's very important for the immune system. It's important obviously for absorbing calcium for the bones. They're actually finding more uses that vitamin D has all the time. They're doing a lot of vitamin D research. So vitamin D levels, uh, vitamin D is very important. Uh, key thing to do is to get a level checked with your doctor to find out where you are. Um, if it's severely low, a person may need to be put on a prescription vitamin D for a while to raise the level, and then they can switch to a supplement vitamin D to maintain it. But I always like to see levels of uh, 75 to 80. The problem is that a lot of doctors don't really understand that importance. So if somebody comes in at 32, you know, it's in the normal range, but it's at the low end of normal, and they'll say, oh, it's normal. You don't need to take anymore. But that level of 32 just is not high enough. It really should be 75 to 80 or 85 even uh, to raise it up. Uh, so yeah, the, the important thing is to get your vitamin D levels checked because there's no, there's no real symptoms with vitamin D deficiency. You have to get the level checked to really know what it is. 
And that's something that's going to take a while. It's not going to just um, bounce back out like it's your right. diet. And then you're going to have to also take supplements. Yeah. Um, so I see that this, the six-week challenge was a challenge from Dr. Loretta Halstead. <laughs> she said that we should do a, a six-week challenge for um, nutrition. And let's create a six-week challenge addressing mind and body health. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I, I think um, that we could definitely do that. And it wouldn't have to be something that is uh, too much. We can make a simple checklist. So Dr. Loretta, I'm going to reach out to you um, and we can definitely um, start that up. And I think this is the perfect time because a lot of times the beginning of January, everyone's like, I'm just going to go keto. I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to do that. And they still drop off anyway. We can just do something about around mindful eating. Um, mm -hmm. Just a simple little checklist. But Roxana, this would, I mean, that really speaks to um, our entire theme. And that is radical self-care. Radical self-care, yeah. Is physical, mental, all of it. And so, um, yes, we will do the challenge. You'll reach out. We're going to put it on our website. Uh, we'll figure it out. And uh, that's super, super exciting. So, yes. So we had five questions that I've been trying to add onto our poll and I can't add it on. <laughs> so I think I'm just going to ask the questions and if people could put them in the chat and then we'll pick Dr. Halstead's brain to see what he thinks the answer should be. So how does that sound? No one responded yet. So the first question, can food be medicine? And I'm gonna put this in the chat and just answer it in the chat. And we're gonna give you a couple minutes and then we're gonna see what our expert speaker has to say about that. So thank you everyone for participating and giving feedback. Uh-oh, that might've been, they're all saying yes. What do you think, Dr. Halstead? <laughs> I, I, tend, I tend to agree with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, food is actually intended to be our medicine. We're actually designed to have those nutrients that are found in the foods are the food are the, the nutrients that keep us healthy. So our food is our medicine. Our medicine is our food. Definitely. So if you answered yes, our expert <laughs> says yes. That's the right answer. <laughs> so next question. How much water should you drink in a day? So I had a few options. One was a gallon, one was a liter, one was eight glasses or one cup. And so we're gonna give you a, 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 a few minutes. So we have eight cups, a gallon, eight glasses, 32 ounces, eight glasses, a lot of eight glasses, 64 ounces, okay. And so anyone else? Eight cups. Andrea, nothing from you. So I just wanted to say something. <laughs> we met last week, yes. And now I have to go get the electrolyte water because I'm like, well, Andrea does not drink regular water. I need to get electrolyte water. <laughs> you, and you probably don't need to, but I, it is my preference. But it can't hurt. So, Dr. Halston. <laughs> oh, and someone has, I heard, drink half your body weight and more. Half body weight in ounces. So what's your answer on how much water should you drink in a day? Well, the last person that answered is correct. Half your body weight or more. Okay. So, because Ms. Joyce, I'm going to put my email in here. That You're the only one who got it right. So that means you deserve a prize. <laughs> Because what you what you need to drink is really based on how big you are. You know, really, it's, it's depending on how, you know, how much water distribution you need. So you can't really say. I mean, eight ounces works. Eight ounce, eight glasses of sixty four ounces. That's great if you weigh one hundred twenty eight pounds because that's half your body weight. Okay? okay, but it's based on your body weight. It's also based on your activity level as well. Okay, if if someone is in a hot climate or they're really active, they may not, may need actually more than half their body weight in ounces. Okay, okay. so. Um, you know, it, it depends on a lot of different factors, but at a minimum, you want to try to shoot for half your body weight in ounces. So if you weigh okay. 
100 pounds, you need to drink 50 ounces. You weigh 150 pounds, you need to drink, drink 75 ounces. And that water can be spread out throughout the day. Okay. okay. So thank you. So Ms. Uh, Joyce, please email me. I have um, a journal for you, especially with the new year. We want people to start their journaling um, and really be mindful about maybe you could log your food on there. Maybe you could log um, just, just some um, good positive affirmations in there to encourage you. So our next question, can you name one food to support your brain health? And I'm gonna put the question in the chat here. And so remember, we had a slide. We have beans, berries, fatty fish, berries. Thank you guys. You guys were paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Onions, mushroom, nuts, seeds, strawberries, that's a good one. And I think that's, it's easy to get kids to fall in love with the fruits and maybe, um, maybe even the colored peppers because they're, they're sweeter. Mm -hmm. The thing is that with babies though, you want to always get them on vegetables first because the, vet, the, the fruits are sweet. And if you give them fruits first, they're going to like that sweetness and they're not going to like you know, you back to the vegetable. <laughs> and then you can introduce the fruit after that. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone who did that good job for that so can where you live this is our next question can where you live affect your food choices and i put the question in the chat so dr halstead did go over this a little bit uh oh miss sheree said of course food desert <laughs> she hit it on the nail. <laughs> All right, so yes and yes. So Dr. Halstead, can where you live affect your food choices? Well, absolutely it can, because obviously if you're in a neighborhood where there's not access to healthy food, it's not access to supermarkets, where you know every other corner is a fast food joint or a liquor store, then yeah, and you really don't have transportation to go anywhere else, and there's nobody bringing healthy food in, to your neighborhood, then that's definitely a big problem. Absolutely, yeah. So please everyone check out that link. Um, the article from Politico addresses that, that Baltimore is actually in a experiment to see how to address the food desert. So some of what they addressed was giving um, lift vouchers to go to, to farther out places to get food also giving vouchers to the liquor store, not liquor stores, I'm sorry, the, those little snack shops to um, have fresh fr um, produce as options. Um, and also other organizations coming into the city like Loyola, um, I know University of Maryland does it as well, have pop-up organic fresh fruits um, stands as options. So it's a good article um, to check out. Last question, are you ready? Hopefully. Do food choices affect mental health? Yes, a lot of yeses. Shania, Tawanda, Lynn. We have a lot of, yep. Lashana said, yep. So Dr. Halstead, to wrap it up, <laughs> do food choices affect mental health? Well, they absolutely do, they absolutely do. Again, you wanna stick with foods that have high nutrient density, meaning lots of, vitamin, lots of vitamins and minerals and low calorie, as opposed to nutrient poor foods, which have high calories, but low vitamin and minerals. As long as you try to, you know, as you make that change to the more nutrient dense foods, then you'll be better off. Not only at the mental function, but also just your total function, period. One good thing that I really like about talking about diets and what you eat is that it's not so much that there's one diet for each organ system. The same diet works for every organ system in your body. So if you get it down, you're gonna be helping everything. You're gonna be helping your mental function. You're gonna be helping your cardiovascular function. You're gonna be helping your kidneys, your GI function 
all those things, your immune system, all those things get better with the G-bombs diet. You know, God made it simple for us. He made it one diet fits all as far as health goes, you know, so, so it's a, it's a, a important thing to, to get down. So you're going to get multiple benefits from multiple systems just by getting your diet straightened out. Thank you so much. That That's so good because I think we need the knowledge to like help us break out of some of the bad habits because I think if we know better, we do choose better. It's just the abundance of bad information makes us think, oh, well, everyone's doing it. Oh, it's okay. It's fine. But it's really, it's setting us up to really um, keep hitting that addiction cycle of the crash and burn and not feeling well and um so thank you so much for um, doing this presentation for us. Well, it's my pleasure. So how can people contact you if they want to consult? I know um, I have a few family members that would be interested just in getting counseling for the PCOS, the um, polycystic, the response that you were giving about the hormones and mm -hmm. diets. So how can people contact you to get a consult? Uh, best way would probably be to go ahead and... Um, I can give you my email and my cell phone. Actually, my, my uh, uh, email is Vitadoc. I'll put it in the chat too. It's Vitadoc, V-I-T-A-D-O-C-335 at gmail.com. And I'll put my uh, cell number in there too. It's 410-688-7825. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Cause I think uh, it's always hard for us to go to a physician when we're not feeling well and just hearing you and um, listening to your principles, I'm sure is gonna help someone want to get the, the support and help they need it. So we have three people in the chat. They're saying, thank you. Okay. So then I will pass it over to Andrea. Do you have any other closing remarks for us? And I know you wanna let us know about upcoming BMHA events. So yeah, so first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was excellent. I'm so excited um, for a number of reasons. I'm excited because I love the scripture you gave, but you know, and, and no buts. I mean, as a man think it, so is he. And so love to the thought of changing the narrative and change messaging. Um, and we will do the six week black health challenge and we'll build it out, figure it out. And we might even get a sponsor to donate something at the end. I don't know. But um, so I'm excited about that. But so we really can't thank you enough because we have made a commitment this year that we were going to help change the trajectory of our community. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, we are not backing down from that. And we're starting with ourselves. And so um, so to have you lead the charge was just an excellent. And so Roxana, kudos to you for your work on this and uh, for your thinking about how we make this happen. So I'm super excited. So a couple of things I do want to share. Again, I'm going to make sure people get their time back. We are a member-driven organization. And so I ask you that uh, you would check our website out, join us as members, lots of perks as members. You get the opportunity to sometimes write a blog or do some other things. But more importantly, you commit to us and say, black mental health is important. Black wellness is important. And so uh, I, I urge you to join us. We're super excited to have you as a part of the Black Mental Health Alliance family. And quite frankly, we are growing. Uh, you, you will look in a, in a bit to see us on a national scale. So we're super excited about that. The other thing is before you go, right after the close of this meeting, there is a survey monkey that will be open. It's a quick and dirty uh, few questions, but it really, really will help us in improving our programming. And so really would hope that you would take the time to do that because we, we get to measure what we're doing. And then the next uh, Mind Health Shop talk, we're doing something for young people, I think uh, February 17th called Young Black Minds Matter. Um, and we're gonna talk to them about how to build, how to build, encourage, heal, um, and show black young people that they are beautiful and that they matter. So please save those dates, we're super excited. And then uh, February 16th, we're gonna talk about black love and self-love and it's nothing like it. And so you say, oh, I'm 
I've been there. And so we're not even calling that a workshop. We're calling it this a build shop. And again, this is designed to, um, to give a brave space, release toxic stress, talk about emotional pain, not just from relationships and past trauma, and then work on a framework for transformational change. And so, uh, and, and, and how, do you, how do we lead in the places where we love? And so you don't want to miss this. Dr. Bruce Pinnell uh, from the Love More Movement will lead that. Uh, Miss Nia Jones uh, from uh, On Purpose with Nia will lead the, the Young Black Minds Matter. And I'm sure I'm missing something, but I don't so know. So speaking of Miss Nia, she has um, dropped in the chat. Don't forget to announce David's book. Oh, yes. So we are, we've got a cut. Oh my gosh, you want to stick around with us because we've got some amazing things coming up. Uh, we're going to do, uh, we are having an author series with our young people. And the, there's a book by the one of our, our, he's a BMHA member and also a partner and uh, uh, almost a doctor, Dr. David Miller. I'm going to go ahead and call him what he is. And his new book is called Chef Toussaint, I think. I might have made that up, but it's about a little boy who learns how to cook. Um, his other book is called Gabe and the Green Thumb. I bought it. My nephew thought it was so funny, um, but it talks about the very thing that Dr. Uh, Halstead is talking about. So you don't want to miss it, th that series. And then we're going to be on Facebook Live tomorrow off the chain talking about the um, about the insurrection, talking about the new vision, but more importantly, about how do we plan for ourselves? Hyped about what will happen uh, in the White House, but in all these little black houses, what are we doing? Um, so super excited about that. Maybe you'll join us for Facebook Live for our pre-discussion uh, and our post. So I think I got it all. Um, and I will turn it back yes. over to Roxana, I think, to say farewell or Vita Zane or whatever else. <laughs> So thank you all for joining. And I forgot to say that Dr. Halstead and um, so the two Dr. Halsteads are BMHA members. And that's one of the great things um, about being a member. You get to, if you're, you want to be part of the Speakers Bureau um, and start initiatives like what Dr. Halstead just did, saying she wants to do a six week challenge and just being able to partner and do things that are really affecting and changing and supporting Black mental health. So um, I think that's it. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. Have a great night. Have a great and, night. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys.